Hi all, and welcome to Let's Read, The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. This week we're looking at Chapter 8, The Evidence of Biochemistry, The Complexity of Molecular Machines. Um, as is common in this book, the chapter opens with a personal story of someone's journey to accepting science and then turning to religion once disillusioned with the scientific worldview. Um, it seems that Strobel has run out of people to do this with, so this chapter he starts with the expert that he's actually going to interview, Michael Behe. Unlike other chapters where usually he in starts with somebody else's story and then interviews the expert. Um, the story is that Behe uh, generally accepted evolutionary explanations for the complexity of life. Um, however, that wasn't to last. Quote, then one day, while doing postdoctorate research on DNA at the National Institutes of Health, he and a colleague were pondering what it would take for life to begin by naturalistic processes. As they enumerated the components that would be needed, proteins, a genetic code, a membrane, and so on, they looked at each other and said, nah. They knew there was no way life could have sprung into existence unaided. Seeds of skepticism were planted. This is the common straw man that creationists use to argue against evolution. Firstly, this is strictly an argument against abiogenesis, not evolution, which is what this chapter is actually supposed to be about. Um, secondly, at the most, this is simply an argument from incredulity, combined with a misunderstanding of what current models of abiogenesis actually say. I mean, even if we had no idea about how cells arose, that hardly implies that they couldn't have arisen naturally. Um, but even that's not the case. While we are no way close to having all the details, we do actually have a pretty good framework of how life could have arisen naturally. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the basic idea is that we're pretty sure that actually quite complex molecules can arise by purely natural processes. Um, we know that molecules that are similar to DNA can form through these purely natural processes. Um, and if any of these molecules are able to catalyze the formation of other molecules that are similar, um, then what you would have is actually the first self-replicating molecule. Um, and if you had a self-replicating molecule, that would actually allow for a kind of evolution to occur. Um, sometimes it's referred to as chemical evolution, um, whereby those molecules that are more efficient at causing other molecules to form similar to them, they would outcompete uh, other self-replicating molecules. And so you'd have slight variation, you would have uh, a competition, and you would essentially have a early proto-form of evolution happening. And simply from there, it's a long line of evolution by natural selection, first with molecules, then with these sort of proto-cells, or things that aren't quite cells but are on their way, then simple cells, and all the way through to these highly complex cells that we see today. Now, this is by no means a settled topic, um, but we do have a, reason, a reasonable framework. Um, research is continuing, and has been actually quite successful so far. And to argue that it's simply impossible to account for abiogenesis would require more than simply an argument from incredulity. Anyway, Strobel then charts how Behe became disillusioned with the limitations of scientific knowledge when it came to the precise details of how cells function. And so he turned to creationism, oh, sorry, intelligent design as a more satisfying answer. Now, the nice thing, I think, about apologetics books is they are all very front-loaded. Um, I'm not sure if this is a conscious choice based on knowing that you know, few people will actually read through the whole book, or if simply the author's enthusiasm for writing the book kind of wanes towards the end, or maybe even that they just assume that if you get this far into the book, you'll swallow anything. Um, but for whatever reason, by the time you get to the back half of a book like this, um, I tend to find that the content gets lighter and lighter, and there's less and less effort put into actually trying to prove their point. Um, and this is certainly true in this book. The earlier chapters had several introductory sections, usually, before getting into the interview. And these introductory sections were often well, generally about other scientists who happened to endorse intelligent design and a lot of background information. Um, this chapter simply has one section, and then it gets straight into the person being interviewed, and the first section is even centred on that same person. So there's even less content there, which is good. Um, the section, this section um, that we're in is Strobel's standard biography of the interviewee. Uh, he lists all the journals that he's published in, he lists all of his books, and he lists anywhere that um, be he has ever delivered a lecture at, basically, or a speech. Um, the centerpiece of Behe's career, according to this book, is his book, uh, Darwin's Black Box. And this is what this chapter is, the whole chapter is basically based on recapitulating that book in a condensed form. Um, about the only thing I found interesting is that uh, 
Strobel went looking for a quote to praise Beatty's book. <laughs> but curiously, the only quote that he actually presents is a another guy from the intelligent uh, is a fellow intelligent designer from the Discovery Institute, um, and isn't even a scientist. Uh, <laughs> and actually, the quote that Strobel uses in this book to endorse how good a guy Behe is actually comes from the back cover of Behe's own book. Um, I don't know, that Strobel apparently couldn't find anybody more, you know, a better endorsement than that is probably a bit telling. In the next section, Behe begins by explaining what he means by black box. Um, basically, the idea is that when we are looking at a system, of some kind of system, it's often completely unnecessary to actually understand how a particular part of the system works, so long as we understand actually what it ends up doing. A good example, an example given in this book, is the idea of a computer. Uh, most people have very little idea about how a computer actually works and you know what's in the guts of it and the hardware and the software all the way down to the physical level. Very few people actually understand all of that stuff. But that doesn't prevent us from actually using a computer. And so to most people, a computer is essentially a black box. Um, we don't know what goes on inside it, but we can still use it. And so the title of Behe's book, Darwin's black box, comes from the fact that in Darwin's time, cells were essentially a black box. Um, scientists at that point really had no idea how any of them worked. Um, they were just kind of blobs under sort of limited power microscopes. But that didn't prevent those scientists from working with them and deriving, you know, conclusions and doing research. Um, quite how that's supposed to be relevant in this chapter, I'm not sure, and Strobel makes no effort to actually explain it. He just gets, you know, just gives us a little introduction to the idea of black box. So, next. B, he explains that while cells may have seemed simple to Darwin's contemporaries, they are actually incredibly complex, as we've found out since then. So apparently in Darwin's day when they looked at cells, they looked like little blobs, and they just assumed that they were sort of relatively simple things. Turns out, as our knowledge has gotten better and our techniques have gotten better, we can now tell that cells are incredibly intricate, complex, chemical um, machines, for want of a better term. So, B, he... Um, says that the existence of such complexity is a direct challenge to evolutionary um, theory, saying, Darwin said in his Origin of Species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, I would actually go even further and say that each modification also cannot be significantly disadvantageous. Um, the important thing here is, though, that as Darwin says, what you would need to demonstrate is that such a feature could not possibly have evolved. Um, and maybe that's a bit too high a standard, but you at least have to show that it almost certainly couldn't have evolved. So Behe then explains in the very next paragraph how his concept of irreducible complexity meets this challenge. Quote, a system or device is irreducibly complex if it has a number of different components that all work together to accomplish the task of the system, and if you were to remove one of the components, the system would no longer function. An irreducibly complex system is highly unlikely to be built piece by piece through Darwinian processes, because the system has to be fully present in order for it to function. The thing is, this doesn't even meet the challenge that he himself has laid out in a paragraph before. Remember, Darwin was talking about a series of modifications, but Behe's response is to rule out removal of a component. Now, modifications and removal, or adding, are not the same thing. Um, so Behe's concept of irreducible complexity fails at the very first hurdle. Unfortunately, Despite Behe's book being out for eight years at the time of publishing this, and now 18 years, um, numerous criticisms have been mounted, mounted on this, um, but this simple objection is lost on Behe. So Strobel uh, and he continue on with this chapter, unfortunately. To illustrate his concept of irreducible complexity, uh, Behe introduces the mousetrap analogy. Um, the idea is that a basic mousetrap that is a wooden block with a spring, a hammer, uh, I think a lever and a little uh, catch that you put the cheese on, um, consists of several components. They must all be present and in the correct arrangement for it to function. Um, in that sense, it is what he would claim is irreducibly complex. So the implication is that the mousetrap was intelligently designed, 
as we all know, um, therefore cells must also be intelligently designed, uh, which is a bogus argument by induction. Anyway, an essential part of Behe's claim is that missing any component of the system renders the entire system useless, and he illustrates this with the mousetrap analogy. Now, if you take away any of these parts, the spring or the holding bar or whatever, then it's not like the mousetrap becomes half as efficient as it used to be, or it only catches half as many mice. Instead, it doesn't catch any mice. It's broken, it doesn't work at all. This is an important part of the definition of irreducible complexity, and it's one reason why eyes aren't irreducibly complex. Um, it's clear that poor eyesight is better than no eyesight. Um, and as such, an eye could actually easily evolve from the simplest light-sensitive cells through to um, eyes set into a concave features, and all the way through to our complex camera eye with lenses and specialised cells. So what Behe's arguing here is that there are complex features that aren't like that. Um, and this is really crucial for what comes later, where Behe basically concedes, without thinking he has. So, Behe repeats his assertion that an irreducibly complex system couldn't arise, what he calls directly from precursor systems. So Strobel asks, you know, is there an indirect route? To which Behe replies, you can't absolutely rule out all theoretical possibilities of a gradual circuitous route, but the more complex the interacting system, the far less likely an indirect route can account for it. And as we discover more and more of these irreducibly complex biological systems, we can be more and more confident that we've met Darwin's criterion of failure. So it seems to me that in the space of one paragraph, um, Behe has basically conceded the argument. Earlier, Behe was arguing that the only way an irreducibly complex system could have evolved was by each part evolving separately, entire, and with its final purpose. Now it seems that he's conceding that evolution need not be like that, um, but he still thinks that it's unlikely. So he's gone from, um, we can show that it couldn't have evolved, to it's unlikely to have evolved. Of course, the only argument that he has actually against it is that the more complexity we find, the more unlikely he thinks it is that we could explain them, therefore intelligent design. Now the problem with this is that he's shifting the burden of proof. Uh, Darwin's test was that something was something that could not have evolved. Behe's response is to point out things that are sufficiently complex that there's no obvious direct evolutionary pathway, and then claim that it's unlikely there's any other pathway. Um, find enough of these and claim that surely one of them, surely one of them couldn't have evolved. Um, but this misses that it's actually up to him to provide us with a single example of something that couldn't have evolved, not to simply assert that there must be one out there. Behe closes the section by inadvertently referencing the problematic regress of intelligent design. And if the creation of a simple device like this requires intelligent design, then we have to ask, what about finely tuned machines of the cellular world? If evolution can't adequately explain them, then scientists should be free to consider other alternatives. The argument, roughly, seems to be that the more complex something is, the more you need an intelligent designer to explain it. Uh, but of course, this falls into the common objection of explaining the intelligent designer itself. Um, the only way out of that is by special pleading, which is why positing an intelligent designer simply pushes the problem back a level. Uh, it doesn't explain the existence of complexity as the result of simpler rules, which is exactly what a scientific theory does, but rather it explains complexity as a result of an even more complex entity, which itself needs explaining. Behe's mousetrap analogy has drawn a lot of fire, and there are many objections to it. Uh, Strobel goes through some of them in this section. Um, the problem with this whole section is that the mousetrap analogy is really only a useful way of communicating the idea of an irreducibly complex system. Um, that is just explaining the concept. It isn't useful in defending the idea that such a system couldn't evolve. Um, we know that mousetraps are designed. It's hardly surprising that the basic model of a mousetrap um, almost certainly couldn't have evolved. The objections that critics are making are simply objections to Behe's claims about biological evolution translated into the mousetrap analogy. 
This translation into the, into the analogy makes them fairly easy for Behe to defend against, while the actual objection against his biological claims is actually left unanswered. Anyway, the first objection covered is the idea that a simpler mouse trap couldn't have exi or could have existed. Um, that is, that you could simply build a mouse trap with fewer parts. Um, and Strobel specifically mentions uh, a man called John MacDonald uh, of the University of Delaware, who produced a number of drawings of simpler mouse traps, all of which were based on the standard basic mouse trap model. Uh, B he has two objections to this. Firstly. I agree there are mouse traps with fewer parts than mine. As a matter of fact, I said so in my book. I said that you can just prop open a box with a stick, or you can use a glue trap. The point of irreducible complexity is not that one can't make some other system that could work in a different way with fewer parts. The point is that the trap we're considering right now needs all of its parts to function. I'm not sure if this response is dishonest or incompetent. Uh, McDonald's drawings, which B. He himself has reproduced in his detailed response to this criticism, specifically show simpler mousetraps made from the parts of a basic mousetrap. That is the trap <laughs> that he is claiming. I mean, he actually shows that, McDonald that is, contrary to what B. He has explicitly claimed, that the basic mousetrap is not irreducibly complex. You can construct very, very poor mousetraps using only some of the mousetrap parts. Um, very, very poor mousetraps, but mousetraps nonetheless. And in Behe's response to McDonald's drawings, he doesn't argue that these machines wouldn't work as mousetraps. His response is actually to argue that there's no straightforward evolutionary path between them. So even in his response, he's acknowledging that mousetraps aren't irreducibly complex. But in this book he ignores that, either because Strobel doesn't make it clear to him what the actual objection is, or because it's simply inconvenient. Um, Behe's second objection is actually even worse, and he says, The challenge to Darwinian gradualism is to get to my trap by means of numerous successive slight modifications. You can't do it. Besides, you're using your intelligence as you try. Remember, the audacious claim of Darwinian evolution is that it can put together complex systems with no intelligence at all. To me, this is mind-blowingly stupid. <laughs> the challenge to evolution is not to show how a mousetrap evolved, since we know that it didn't. It's just an analogy. <laughs> also, to reconstruct how something evolved does require intelligence. That's not an argument against evolution. The fact that evolution itself requires no intelligence doesn't mean that understanding evolution requires no intelligence. I mean, if that was the case, we wouldn't have books like this. The next objection to Behe's mousetrap analogy is that the components of a mousetrap could serve other functions. And Behe's response to this is to say, the problem is that it's not an argument against anything I've ever said. In my book, I explicitly point out that some of the components of biochemical machines can have other functions. But the issue remains, can you use numerous, slight, successive modifications to get from those other functions to where we are? This is moving the goalposts. Uh, Behe's claim is that irreducible, complex systems can't have evolved on the basis that all of its components are necessary for it to function. Now, when a critic points out that a system could have been functional with parts missing, just some other function. So functional, not in the, uh, the end way, but in a different way. Um, this actually strikes to the core of Behe's argument. If his only response is to send, say then, but how did it evolve from one function to another? This is implicitly conceding the argument. So anyway, after this re weak response, uh, Behe goes on to again argue that to find functions for partial mouse traps requires intelligence, and therefore it's intelligent design. And it's the same bad argument that equates the process of evolution from understanding how evolution worked. Process requires no intelligence, understanding how it works does require intelligence. Behe closes this section by arguing that we don't have a good account of how the various components of a cell assemble themselves correctly. Um, this is not an assertion that I'm qualified to answer, but a cursory scan of the internet seems to support that. Um, it seems that there are a lot of unsolved problems in cell biology, um, and uh, understanding cells at a molecular level is a very new field. Um, but Behe's argument is simply an argument from ignorance. Uh, no one's explained it yet, therefore it can't be explained, therefore intelligent design. The next section is Behe explaining uh, the irreducible complexity of cilia. 
Um, cilia are hair-like structures on the outside of cells that move in coordinated whip-like movements. Uh, Behe explains the complexity of the molecular structures of cilia, and he explains how there are three broad components of a cilia. Um, you have rods, linkers, and motors, um, all of which, according to him, are absolutely necessary for cilia to function. That is, these three parts form an irreducibly complex uh, system. When Strobel asks why being irreducibly complex means that it can't have evolved, B, he says, You only get the motion of the cilium when you've got everything together. None of the individual parts can do the trick for themselves. You need them all in one place. For evolution to account for that, you would have to imagine how this could develop gradually, but nobody's been able to do that. Uh, Strobel then proposes that maybe the parts had other functions. You know, perhaps the rod parts of the cilia could have been used as part of the protein transport in the cell. Behe dismisses Strobel's suggestion, claiming that in order for them to have other functions, they would have had to be precisely tuned to that function and that usage, um, and that would have made them useless for this use. Um, the problem with this is that Strobel is hardly a competent expert. I mean, the fact that Strobel can't produce an explanation for how cilia evolved doesn't mean that no one can. And even if no one could, that hardly implies design. Um, that's just the same old argument from ignorance. And since Behe feels that he's established that cilia couldn't have evolved, he then considers the possibility of it arising through multiple, multiple simultaneous mutation, that is by random chance. Um, no one seriously believed this, that this is what's happened, um, but it's a convenient straw man for Behe to beat up. Uh, the only interesting thing in, in it is the in the analogy that Behe uses to explain how unlikely this is, um, he deliberately chooses a scenario where the random events occurring um, only occur like once a year, which is a subtle insinuation, I think, that to try and set up the reader with this idea that there just simply isn't enough time for natural processes to have accounted for complexity. Anyway, he finishes the section with a simple assertion that evolution can only work by successively adding parts to a system, never by taking away redundant components, and that is just plain wrong. The next section is about uh, bacterial flagella. Um, Behe gives a reasonable description of them as sort of whip-like structures like cilia, but they rotate to produce a propeller-like motion which enables the bacteria to move. Behe goes on to say that no one has produced an evolutionary explanation for an irreducibly complex biochemical system, such as the bacterial flagellum. And he backs this up with a quote from Andrew Pomienkowski. Pick up any biochemistry textbook and you will find perhaps two or three references to evolution. Turn to one of these and you will be lucky to find anything better than evolution selects the fittest molecules for their biological function. Unfortunately, this is quote mining Pomienkowski. Uh, uh, this comes from Pomienkowski's review of Behe's book back in 1996. And at that time, biochemistry was essentially just a branch of chemistry, not biology. And hence, very little evolutionary thinking had made its way into biochemistry. Um, this is partially because biochemistry was quite a young field of research, and most research was focused on what cells did, uh, rather than how they came to be that way. Uh, Pomienkowski was bemoaning the then current state of affairs in biochemistry, but at the same time he was utterly rejecting Behe's intelligent design arguments. That no solid evolutionary explanations had been made in 1996 was understandable given the state of the science. Since then, much research has been done into exactly this question, and we have a much better understanding of the possible evolutionary pathways um, for these structures. I mean, even in 2004, when this book was published, we were in a much better position. And so to quote Pomienkowski from eight years prior to this book um, seems to me to be dishonest. Uh, Behe's response to the idea that a new field shouldn't be expected to have clear explanations for unknown phenomena is this. Darwinists always accuse folks in the intelligent design movement of making an argument from ignorance. Well, that's a pure argument from ignorance. They're saying, we have no idea how this could have happened, but let's assume evolution somehow did it. You've heard God of the gaps, inserting God when you don't have another explanation. Well, this is evolution of the gaps. This is a false equivalence. Due to the extraordinary success of evolution in explaining biological structures, it is a fair hypothesis to consider that unknown structures arose by evolutionary processes. Uh, no one asserts that they must have done when the evidence isn't there. What scientists say is that if we don't know, then it's reasonable to look for evolutionary explanations. 
I mean, the big difference between making a tentative assumption that evolution can explain something that we don't understand on one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that intelligent design can explain it, is that evolution is not defined by exclusion. All the arguments for intelligent design explicitly require us to first establish that something could not have evolved or occurred by chance, and that therefore it was intelligently designed. I mean, this means that the only way that we can conclude design is by excluding all other naturalistic explanations. I mean, design cannot be verified directly. Evolution can be, and it has been which is why it's fair to look for evolutionary explanations. And in the absence of evidence one way or the other, is to still conclude that evolutionary explanations are probably more likely. In this section, uh, Behe gives an explanation of the complexity of a eukaryotic cell. Um, and eukaryotic cells are one of the three main types of cells and they comprise most complex, uh, I think all complex multicellular organisms, almost all, uh, uh, you know, close to my heart, humans in included. Uh, Particularly how the eukaryotic cell, which has a nucleus, is divided into different sections. So the cell isn't one just one blob of mat stuff, it's actually got lots of different rooms within the cell, it seems way. Um, and the different sections do different things, and there are various molecules that are produced in some areas and moved to other areas and need to be transported around the cell. And this is, I find, really fascinating stuff. Um, and since his argument is that it's based on the idea that cells are complex, I mean, at least that's one component of his argument, he does actually need to go into all this detail and explain it. But all he manages to show is that a eukaryotic cell is incredibly complex, and that's hardly in dispute here. I mean, before actually making any kind of case beyond that, he just simply concludes a section with this quote. So, you've got numerous components, all of which have to be in place, or nothing works. If you don't have the signal, if you don't have the truck, you're pretty much out of luck. Now, does this microscopic transportation system sound like something that's self-assembled by gradual modifications over the years? I don't see how it could have been. To me, it has all the earmarks of being designed. And that's the only argument he's got. It, it's just an argument from incredulity. And yes, actually, a highly tuned system like that does sound like something uh, that could have evolved given the billions of years, literally billions of years, that eukaryotic cells have been evolving for, and the fact that this kind of transportation system within eukaryotic cells are ubiquitous in almost half of all life forms on this planet, you've got that many cells all evolving, it doesn't actually sound that surprising to me that it could have produced such a highly tuned system. So this next section is focused on how blood clots. Um, Behe argues that blood clotting in humans requires a highly choreographed cascade of 10 steps that uses about 20 different molecular components. Again, Behe claims that this is an irreducibly complex system. However, this section is really just, so Strobel can ask Behe about gene duplication as a possible objection to his ideas. Um, Behe explains that gene duplication um, explains it with reference to his mousetrap analogy. So he starts by saying, um, let's imagine a sort of proto-mousetrap, um, a sort of a incredibly, incredibly crude mousetrap that consists of simply one spring bent with its ends together under tension. Um, if a mouse happened by and knocked it, uh, the spring might uncoil and hit the mouse. So this is an incredibly poor mousetrap, but it still fits the function of a mousetrap just very poorly. It's sort of proto-mousetrap. So Strobel then uses... Um, this analogy to try and explain how gene duplication um, would work. According to the concept of gene duplication, you would make a copy of the first uh, spring. Now you've got two springs, except the second spring somehow becomes a wooden base. Do you see the conceptual disconnect? You can't just say the spring somehow morphs into a wooden base without doing more than just saying gene duplication did it. The problem is, Darwinists don't provide the details of how this can actually happen in the real world. He then continues a couple of paragraphs later, saying, Nobody's been able to show how a duplicated gene can develop some new function where it starts to make a new and irreducibly complex pathway. Um, this is perhaps the most stupid or most dishonest thing that Behe has said in this chapter. 
Uh, to say that evolutionary theory provides no mechanism whereby a duplicated gene can change its function and take on a new role is to completely ignore genetic mutation. Think of this mouse trap analogy. Imagine the two spring trap. So you have gene duplication, as he puts it, now you've got two springs. Uh, and imagine as it evolves, <laughs> one of the springs becomes bigger and heavier and less springy. It gradually becomes larger and flatter, and at each step it makes the whole thing more stable and provides a better anchor for the other spring to uncoil from, potentially killing mice. Um, that is, at each step as it becomes larger and larger, because it provides a better anchor, the mousetrap is more and more functional. Eventually, the second spring will resemble a large, flat piece of metal. No longer a spring, now it's a base. Voila! Exactly the two-component mousetrap that Behe is saying couldn't have evolved. I mean, of course, he is strictly true to say that gene duplication doesn't explain this. You also need to consider the role that mutation plays. But to say that nobody has been able to show how a duplicated gene can develop some new function is so blatantly wrong that I can only conclude that he's being dishonest. Okay, the next section covers an experiment by a man called Barry Hall at the University of Rochester in 1982 uh, that poses a direct threat to Behe's claims about irreducible complexity. Uh, Kenneth R. Miller opposed, a, opposed this challenge to Behe's claims. The true acid test, explained Miller, would be to use the tools of molecular genetics to wipe out an existing multi-part system and then see if evolution can come to the rescue with a system to replace it. If the system can be replaced purely by naturalistic evolutionary processes, then Behe's theory has been disproved. Behe agrees that this would be a suitable test. The only problem for Behe is this is exactly what Hall did in 1982. So bacteria contain a number of genes that essentially allow them to metabolise lactose. Hall engineered a bacterium that was missing uh, the gene that produces this enzyme that metabolizes the lactose. And then he placed them in a lactose-rich environment and basically let evolution do its thing. Um, after a short while, the bacteria were able to metabolize lactose again. Um, and when their genome was examined, it was found that not only had they evolved a new gene to produce a lactose metabolizing enzyme, but they'd also evolved a new gene to turn the production of that enzyme on and off in the presence of lactose, and another gene to produce an enzyme that promotes the absorption of lactose into the cell. That is, the bacteria had three new genes that now formed an irreducibly complex system. None of those genes would have worked by themselves, and none were based on the old gene. So it's not that it re-evolved the old system, it actually uh, evolved a completely new system that meets Behe's criteria for irreducibly complex. That is, we have laboratory evidence that an irreducibly complex system, as per Behe's definition, evolved. This is an absolute destruction of Behe's claims that irreducible complexity cannot arise by evolution. So, of course, he has to dismiss this. Firstly, he claims that since Hall only knocked out one gene, this doesn't count. Um, but that goes against all he's claimed about irreducible complexity. I mean, the whole point was that the system couldn't work if it was missing even one part. And here, the bacteria didn't even re-evolve miss the missing bit. It evolved a whole new system. Secondly, Behe claims that since Hall put these bacteria in an environment where they had a food source other than lactose, that he intervened to keep the system going while evolution was trying to come up with a replacement part, and that this amounts to intelligent intervention. But again, all Hall did was place them into an environment where they could survive, not one that necessitated that them evolving to process lactose. I mean, the lactose processing genes that they evolved were irreducibly complex by his definition, and we know that they evolved. So it's not like Hall engineered them. Still, Behe doesn't accept this and continues to assert that since it has, this hasn't happened in nature, it doesn't count, despite him opening the section by accepting the challenge. Okay, the next section starts with a, an examination of uh, self-organisation as a possible explanation for complexity. Um, the idea is that, like snowflakes, um, some complexity can be the result of simple physical laws. Now, Behe argues that such laws can't explain abiogenesis, 
arguing that scientists have been taking this approach with bi abiogenesis research and that they are more confused about the origins of life than 50 years ago. Uh, this is simply wrong. Behe is actually just ignoring the many important advances in abiogenesis research. Anyway, he summarises his argument for intelligent design like this. Right now, there's only one principle that we know can come up with complex interactive systems, and that's intelligence. Natural selection has been proposed, but there's little or no evidence backing that claim. Some people had high hopes for self-organisational properties or complexity theory, but there's no evidence that these can explain something as complicated as the cell. The only force known to be able to make irreducibly complex machines is intelligent design. This is a textbook argument for, from ignorance. I mean, there is no positive case for intelligent design. Um, just that if we can rule out other explanations, then God must have done it. Um, but apologists haven't been able to rule out every other explanation. I mean, at best, they've simply excluded the ones that have been put forward. That's not every other explanation, and therefore it's certainly premature to conclude design. Anyway, uh, Behe then goes on to argue for intelligent design with this argument. So scientists are in the curious position of ignoring something they know to be capable of explaining what they see in biology, in favour of phantom or totally unproved explanations. Why ignore intelligent design when it's a good match for the data? Yes, we have to keep an open mind in science, but we shouldn't be ignoring the most obvious explanation for all the evidence we have today. What are scientists ignoring? I mean, there are no known intelligences that can produce what we see in biology. I mean, the most advanced intelligences that we know of, our own, are incapable of producing things uh, of such complexity and on such a scale. Scientists aren't ignoring a known explanation. They're simply waiting for intelligent design to prove its case, which it hasn't. B then goes on to defend intelligent design against the claim that it's unfalsifiable, saying, What's really ironic is that intelligent design is routinely called unfalsifiable by the very people who are busy trying to falsify it. Intelligent design's strong point is that it's falsifiable, just like a good scientific theory should be. Now what Behe's doing here is equivocating on what he means by intelligent design. I mean, the argument from design, or intelligent design in general, is unfalsifiable. However, occasionally someone is either brave enough or stupid enough to make an argument that is falsifiable. Um, and Behe did so with his concept of irreducible complexity. Um, he claimed that any system of multiple parts that relied on all parts being present in order to function could not have evolved. That is actually a good, falsifiable hypothesis. Turns out it was wrong. Um, did he, or anyone else, then accept that intelligent design itself had been falsified? No. Uh, even if he discarded the argument from irreducible complexity, he would have just come up with some other design argument, like specified complexity or something else. I mean, that's why intelligent design as a whole is unfalsifiable, while irreducible complexity is falsifiable and has been falsified. Behe goes on to argue that evolution is unfalsifiable, saying that Darwinists claim that some unintelligent process could produce the flagellum. But this is wrong. I mean, evolution is falsifiable because it doesn't assert that just some process produced the flagellum, but actually that evolution via natural selection that involves mutations in genetic information did produce the flagellum. That is, if it was shown that some other process produced it, even a naturalistic process, that would falsify the hypothesis that flagella evolved. Simple. Behe closes the section with a kind of sneaky ad hominem, saying that people who argue against intelligent design get really angry and only really disagree because they are anti-religious. Um, in a beautiful act of projection, he says, we should not use what we want to be true to dismiss arguments or try to avoid them. <laughs> Which is good advice, if only he and Strobel would take it. The final section, as usual, has Strobel and Behe musing on how intelligent design bolsters their Christian faith. Um, he quotes Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, then future Pope, now ex-Pope, 
um, in support of this idea that intelligent design supports Christian faith, which is curious because the Catholic Church actually has a fairly pro-evolution position. And one of the experts actually arguing against intelligent design in this chapter was Kenneth R. Miller, himself a Roman Catholic and anti-creationist. So, the main interesting point in this section is the idea that science in the last 50 years or so is now pointing towards the existence of a creator. And I actually find this interesting because I think it actually explains a lot about intelligent design. Uh, firstly, note that intelligent design arguments don't exist based on settled science. It's not like the science that we settled 400 years ago uh, provides any kind of intelligent design arguments. All of them come out of science that is you know, in the last 50 years. Um, any field in which, you know, the results are settled um, or and there's some kind of overwhelming consensus, the results always point away from a creator god or at best a neutral. All of the science that apologists use is recent, uncertain and still up for some debate. I mean, this uncertainty and debate is used by apologists to insert their god into. Um, this is not what we would expect if the intelligent design was actually true. I mean, apologists can give no explanation for why an intelligent designer would only intervene in the natural order at such a subtle level that it would take all of our scientific advances to get to the point where we could even begin to detect it. I mean, this is a hidden god that contradicts most major religions. I mean, and certainly the Christianity of Strobel and Behe. I mean, if intelligent design establishes a creator, it's not the god of Christianity. Before I finish, I actually want to summarise Behe's position, um, because I don't think he's made it explicit what his argument is. Um, so, irreducible complexity is defined as a biological system is irreducibly complex if, one, it has multiple parts, and two, removing any one part renders the system non-functional. Now, with that definition, the argument uh, from irreducible complexity is, premise one, parts of a biological system must have a function. Premise two, systems evolve by accumulating parts. Conclusion one, an evolutionary precursor to a system will have fewer parts, but still function. Premise three, by definition, an irreducibly complex system cannot function with fewer parts. Conclusion two, an irreducibly complex system cannot have evolved. As I've already pointed out, premises one and two are both false. Uh, premise one is false because it's equivocating on the word function. The function of a part of a system often changes as the system evolves. Arms turn into wings, genes for metabolizing fucose turn into genes for metabolizing propaniodol. Premise one is also false because not all parts require a function. Um, it's quite compatible with evolution that some parts of the genome, say, would serve no purpose and be non-functional. I mean, if selection pressure is very low, then even mutations that are mildly harmful can survive within a population. And that is not against evolution. Premise two is also false because not all systems evolve by gaining parts. I mean, some evolve by losing parts. And if a system evolves by losing parts, it could have evolved from a system that wasn't itself irreducibly complex. What do I mean by that? Well, it's quite possible that you had a long chain of not irreducibly complex systems that were each accumulating parts. That is, those systems didn't rely on all of their parts to function, and it kept gaining and gaining parts until the system gained its current function, so it was able to do what it currently does. Then from that part, a place, it could then lose parts until it was irreducibly complex. That is, it couldn't lose any more parts and still serve that function. That way you have a nice evolutionary chain whereby a system can evolve to be irreducibly complex. Because these two premises are false, the argument is unsound. Now, I actually like the argument from irreducible complexity because, unlike most of the fine-tuning arguments, it actually makes specific claims that are testable. I mean, sure, the claims it makes are false, and intelligent advo uh, design advocates don't accept that, but at least they're falsifiable, and I actually prefer that in an argument. Anyway, that's it for this chapter and for this video. Join me next week for chapter 9, the evidence of biological information, the challenge of DNA, and the origin of life. See you later.